Welcome to this lecture series on regulation of gene expression <coughs> in eukaryotes, basics and benefits. This is lecture number 23. <coughs> in the last two lectures, we focused our attention primarily on how gene expression is regulated by nuclear receptors. <coughs> we first looked at the regulation of gene expression by steroid hormones, then which are called as the type 1 receptors. Then we came and then looked at the regulation of gene expression by non-steroid hormone receptors or the type 2 receptors, which include vitamin D receptor, thyroid hormone receptor, retinoid receptors and so on and so forth. And we discussed <coughs> primarily how these receptors bind to their DNA. We had, dem we had uh, discussed that the steroid receptors primarily bind as homodimers to inverted repeat sequences, whereas the non-steroid receptor or the type 2 receptors were bind to DNA as heterodimers and the heterodimeric partner is a receptor called as retinoid X receptor. And unlike the steroid receptors, these type 2 receptors bind to DNA as heterodimers with RXR as a common heterodimeric partner and they bind, bind to direct repeat sequences. <coughs> so, having discussed how these receptors bind to DNA, today we are going to discuss the mechanism by which these receptors activate transcription. So, what is the mechanism of transcription activation by nuclear receptors? So, we are going to focus our attention on the ligand binding domain, whereas in the last two classes we had focused our attention primarily on the DNA binding domain. So, let us now see once the receptors bind DNA, how do they activate transcription? <coughs> that is going to be the focus of today's lecture. <coughs> so, the nuclear receptor superfamily <coughs> consists of basically steroid receptors as well as the non steroid receptors. Under, under the steroid receptors, we discussed about the mechanism by steroid hormones such as estrogen, progesterone, androgens and glucocorticoids regulate gene expression. Basically, we had demonstrated that these receptors primarily bind to DNA as dimers and the DNA binding domain contains a, what is called a P box which is responsible for recognizing the specific DNA sequence and there is also a dimer interface which is involved in the dimerization of the nuclear receptors. And these steroid hormone receptors primarily bind to inverted repeat sequences. For example, here the glucocorticoid receptor binding set is shown, it binds AGA, ACA, TGT, TCT. <coughs> Whereas, in direct contrast to the steroid hormone receptors, the non steroid lipophilic hormones like vitamin D, retinoic acid, fatty acids, thyroid hormone, all these receptors bind as heterodimers. And all these receptors, the common heterodimeric partner is a receptor called as retinoid X receptor or RXR. And the RXR nuclear receptor complex then bind to direct repeat sequences in this example, for example, AGGTCA, AGGTCA separated by a specific spacer. If these two half sets are separated by three nucleotide spacer, it becomes a vitamin D response element. If the spacer is four bases, it becomes a thyroid hormone response element. And if it is a five base pair, it becomes a retinoid acid response element. So, we discussed about what is called a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 rule and so on and so forth. So, let us now see once they bind DNA, how do they activate transcription? Now, the nuclear receptor superfamily is a large family <coughs> and as we discover more and more new receptors, the family size is increasing. And uh, <coughs> as recently as uh, last year, at least 48 nuclear receptors have been identified in humans and at least 23 ligands have been identified for many of these receptors. There are still 25 receptors which are known as the orphan receptors. That means, we still do not know what are the ligands for these nuclear receptors. So, there is a lot more work needs to be done to understand all and characterize all the members of this nuclear receptor superfamily. <coughs> now, let us now see once the receptor binds DNA, how does it activate transcription? And we all know we had discussed in detail that all the members of this nuclear receptor family share a common structural uh, features. They contain amino terminal domain, which consists of a transcription activation function known as the activation function 1, which is ligand independent. It consists of a DNA binding domain, which consists of two zinc fingers, which is in which in the case of steroid receptors bind to inverted repeat sequences. In the case of the non steroid receptors, it binds to the direct repeat sequences. And then it has a ligand binding domain which is involved in the ligand binding and it contains a very important transcription activation function called EAF2 or activation function 2, which is a ligand dependent function. The EAF1 in the N-terminal domain is a ligand independent transcription activation domain, whereas the EAF2 in the ligand binding domain is a ligand dependent transcription activation function. So, the discussion of the last two classes has been primarily on the DNA binding domain, how exactly these receptors bind to DNA. Today, we are going to shift our focus to the ligand binding domain and ask the question, once they bind DNA, how does the ligand binding domain interact with the transcription machinery leading to 
rate of increase in the rate of transcription or activation of genes in response to these hormones. Now, the transcription activation by the ligand bound nuclear receptors is mediated by interactions with nuclear receptor coactivators. We had discussed in our early series of lectures, especially the first 15 lectures, how activators binding to enhancer sequences interact with basal transcription machinery through coactivators and how histones play a very important role in this transcription activation process. So, whether it is nuclear receptors or whether it is cyclic AMP response membrane binding protein or whether it is nuclear factor kappa B or any of these transcription factors, ultimately the word mechanism by which they activate transcription is by interacting, interacting with specific coactivators and these coactivators in turn recruit histone modifying enzymes like histone acetylases and so on and so forth re, 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 resulting in the removal of the histone in the vicinity of the promoter and recruiting the basal transcription machinery and enhancing the rate of transcription. So, the same mechanism operates for the nuclear receptors as well. So, the ability of nuclear receptors to alternate between activation and repression in response to specific molecular cues is now known to be attributable to a diverse group of cellular factors known as the nuclear receptor co-regulators. <coughs> so, the nuclear receptors take the help of these co-regulators and by interacting with the specific co-regulators, they can either enhance the transcription of target genes or they can repress the transcription of target genes. If these receptors interact with co-repressors, then it results in the repression of transcription, whereas if they interact with co-activators, it results in the activation of transcription. So, what we will discuss in the next few minutes to see what is the mechanism by which these nuclear receptors interact with coactivators and co-repressors. <coughs> in general, the coactivators for many of these transcription factors have been very well characterized not only for nuclear receptors, but also for other transcription factors and they fall into a number of categories. For example, the, there are coactivators which are basically acetyl transferases and these belong to members of what is called as the steroid receptor coactivators or P166 family. So, their primary job is to acetylate histones and this acetylation of histones leads to removal of the histones from the chromatin leading to re resulting in the recruitment of general transcription factors and RNA polymerase resulting in activation of transcription. Some of the coactivators can be ubiquity ligases and one of the example is what is called E6AP. The coactivators can also be chromatin remodeling complexes and the example is SWISNF <coughs> BRG1 complex. Sometimes the coactivators can be protein methylase, protein methylases, for example, histone methylases, and examples can be CARM1 and PRMT1. Again, these are all histone, acetyl trans, histone methyl transferases or histone methylases. Sometimes the coactivators cannot be, need not even be proteins, they can even be RNA, and one example is called as the SRA, <coughs> which is actually involved in a uh, regulation of steroid hormone receptors. So, even RNA molecule can be a coactivator. And sometimes proteins involved in cell cycle regulation like CDC25B can also function as coactivators for certain transcription factors. Certain RNA helicases like P72 have also been shown to be function as coactivators and members of trap drip complex which foster direct contacts with components of basal transcriptionary can also serve as coactivators. So, what we will do in the next few slides is to see which of these actually function as coactivators for the steroid thyroid receptor superfamily or the nuclear receptor superfamily. Now, the evidence for the existence of coactivators came actually from what are called as quelching experiments or competition for a common limiting factor. What was observed is that when you now take a particular receptor and then transfect with a response element linked to a reporter gene to which this receptor binds, we normally know we, the receptor is expressed from this uh, expression plasmid which then goes and binds to the response element and activates the expression of the reporter gene. This is what we discussed as co-transfection, cis-trans co-transfection assay in the previous class. Now, along with this reporter plasmid and this expression plasmid, if you now express another receptor which does not actually bind to the target element or the, or the cis plasmid what was actually observed is that this expression of this other receptor can actually result in the repression of transcription from the receptor A. Although this receptor is not binding to the response element, it is able to repress the transcription of the receptor encoded by the uh, express from the other receptor. These kind of experiments known as a squelching experiment suggested that there are probably certain common proteins with which both this receptor A and receptor B are interacting and as a result, even though they are not one of this other receptor is not binding to DNA, it is able to bind to these coactivators and as a result, it is able to repress the transcription from the receptor A and as a result, it is not able to bind to the response element to activate transcription. <coughs> 
these experiments suggested that there could be some common mediators or common coactivators which bind to both receptor A as well as receptor B. Then the search started what are these coactivators and how do you identify these coactivators which interact with these nuclear receptors. These experiments came from a number of experimental approaches. One of them which was very popular is what is called as the yeast 2 hybrid system. Again we discussed this yeast 2 hybrid system was one of the early lectures wherein basically if you want to study protein protein interaction you use this yeast hybrid system 2 hybrid system where you have what is called as a bait vector as well as a target vector and using a beta gal assay we can actually identify the what are the proteins which are actually interacting with your target protein. <coughs> using that kind of a experimental approaches these nuclear core co nuclear receptor coactivators were identified and first authentic transcription coactivator for steroid receptors was known as the steroid receptor coactivator 1 or SRC1. Later many such coactivators have been identified for example what are known as the GRIP1 and PCIP1. PCIP. <coughs> Now what are these SRC1 family of proteins? These SRCP160 family of proteins basically contain N terminus which contains what is called as a tandem pass or beta helix loop helix motifs. They also contain a centrally located domain which binds to certain coactivators like the Krebs binding protein or the P300 which are histone acetyl transferases. They also contain a C terminal region which mediates interaction with certain methyl transfers like the CRM coactivator. <coughs> So, these are some of the characteristic features of this SRC family of coactivators. Now, in the case of the nuclear receptors, the coactivators fall into a number of categories. There are some of the coactivators for nuclear receptors can be chromatin remodeling factors like the Schweiznef complex, or in certain cases, they could be histone acetyl transferases such as the SRC1 GRIP1 PCIP, or it could be P300 CBP, or it could be PKF or the P300 CBP associated factor or in some cases it could be activated protein like trap or drip which actually interact with the basal transcription machinery. So, a variety of proteins either it can be chromatin remodeling factors or it could be histone acetyl transferases or it could be protein which directly interact with basal transcription machinery have all been identified as coactivators which interact with specifically with nuclear receptors and bring about transcriptional activation. <coughs> now, what is the general mechanism by which this transcription activation is brought about. We know that the nuclear receptors bind to DNA as dimers either as homodimers in the case of steroid receptors or heterodimers in the case of the non-steroidal lipophilic receptors and once these receptors bind to the target sequence as a dimer it results in and then when the ligand is present the ligand will bind to the ligand binding domain and in the presence of ligand these receptors are now able to interact with these coactivators in this case for example the SRC or the steroid receptor coactivator and this coactivator in turn interacts with proteins such as the histone acetyl transferases like CBP or P300 which in turn interacts with the CBP um, associated factor of PCAF and these then acetylate the histones in the vicinity of the promoter and this histone acetylation results in the loosening of the histones, recruitment of the general transcription factors and RNA polymerase leading to activation of transcription. So, this is the general mechanism by which nuclear receptors bring about transcription activation. So, the ligand bind receptor recruits or binds specifically with the steroid receptor or coactivator molecules such as the SRC which in turn bind to specific histone acetyl transferases which remove histones so that the general transcription factors now can bind to the Tata box and then activate transcription. So, this is how hormone responsive genes are activated by the hormone bound transcript uh, hormone receptors. For example, if we take the estrogen receptor as an example. The estrogen receptor in the presence of ligand binds to the estrogen receptor as a homodimer and this hormone bound estrogen receptor now recruits <coughs> certain proteins like P160 and PBP and P160 in turn recruits the P300 which is histone acetyl transferase and P300 or CBP will now acetylate histones in the vicinity of the promoter and as a result the histones are removed and now the RNA polymerase and the general transcription factors can bind and activate transcription. So, this is the mechanism by which estrogen receptor, estrogen receptor brings about transcription activation in the presence of estrogen hormone. If you come to glucocorticoid receptor, it is glucocorticoid receptor transcription activation is one of the most well studied uh, mechanisms of transcription activation by the nuclear receptor superfamily and has been shown that a number of coactivators exist for glucocorticoid receptor. It can be SYSNF complex which are chromatin remodeling proteins, it could be histone acetyl transferases like P300, P160 and PCAF or it could be 
rip trap complex which actually interact with the basal transcription machinery. So, the human glucocorticoid receptor alpha interact with several distinct chromatin modulators through transcription activation domains. These include the main drive switching or the sucrose non fermenting complex or the SWI sniff complex which are chromatin remodelers or it could be P300 CBP which serve as the macromolecular docking platform for transcription factor from several tra signal transaction cascades including nuclear receptors, CRAB, AP1, NFKB, P53 as well as TATS. So, the P300 CBP which is already involved, already been shown to be involved in transcription activation by number of other transcription factor is also involved in the transcription activation by glucocorticoid receptor. Similarly, the other group of coactivators which are involved in transcription activation glucocorticoid receptor include the vitamin D receptor interacting protein or the DRIP or th also known as thyroid hormone receptor associated protein or TRAP. So, you can see depending upon the cell type, depending on the situation or depending upon the stimulus and depending upon the tissue type <coughs> or during this developmental stage, the glucocorticoid receptor can interact with any one of these coactivators and bring about transcription activation in response to glucocorticoid hormone. <coughs> now, the question comes <coughs> how do the coactivators interact with the uh, glucocorticoid receptor or the steroid hormone receptors? <coughs> So, how does the AF2 domains interact with the coactivated receptors and what are the features of the coactivators or the domains in the coactivators which is involved in the interaction with these nuclear receptors. Now, a lot of effort has gone into characterizing the ligand binding domain of the nuclear receptors. You basically over express these ligand binding domains in E. coli, purify these proteins and subject it to X-ray crystallography and based on that you get the crystal structure. Now, the crystal structure of both unliganded as well as ligand bound receptors have been uh, is now known for a number of receptors and based on these studies it has been shown that the ligand binding actually induces a conformational change in the ligand binding domain of the receptor. For example, the ligand binding domain has been shown to have number of alpha helices which have been named from helix 1 to helix 12 and in the case of the ligand binding domain the helix 11, helix 12 play a very important role. In the absence of the ligand binding domain, the helix 12 is actually protruding out, but once the ligand binds to this the ligand binding domain, you can see the helix 1 is taken in and this, this conformational change or the rearrangement of this alpha helices within the ligand binding domain is what is responsible for whether the receptor is going to interact with the core repressor or whether it is going to interact with the coactivator. So, the conformational change that is induced by the ligand binding domain now facilitates or now is <coughs> Uh, favorable for interacting the coactivator or in some cases when the ligand is not bound this kind of a conformation a core repressor is able to bind to the ligand binding domain. So, depending upon the conformational change induced by the ligand binding domain in the presence or absence of the receptor the ligand binding domain receptors or the alpha helices of this receptor either can interact with the core repressor or they can interact with a coactivator. These are the structures of retinoic acid receptor and you can see the retinoic acid receptor ligand binding domain, the helicic helical structure in the absence of retinoic acid whereas, when you add retinoic acid the, there is a change in the conformation you can see. Now, the ligand binding is a conformational change, the helix 12 and helix level are rearranged and under these conditions it is now can interact with a coactivator. <coughs> now, <coughs> how do these helices, helix 11, helix 12 of these nuclear receptors interact with coactivators? It turns out the nuclear receptor coactivators also contain alpha helical motices which contain a specific amino acid sequence known as the LXXLL motif also known as the nuclear receptor box. So, L stands for leucine, X can be any amino acid again LL. So, the nuclear receptor coactivators interact with these specific alpha helices of the nuclear receptors through motifs which contain an amino acid sequence called LXXLL motif that is leucine, any amino acid, any amino acid, leucine, leucine. This is the motif that is interacting with the specific amino acid residues of these helices in the nuclear receptor ligand binding domain. So, this LXS, LXXLL motif is also known as the nuclear receptor box and this through this motif the coactivators interact with the AF2 domain of the ligand bound nuclear receptors. You can see here, <coughs> these are all the nuclear co receptor coactivators which have been identified for a number of receptors. And if you look at the amino acid sequence of these receptors, the boxes highlighted in the red, you can see L, X, X, L, L, <coughs> leucine, any amino acids, leucine, leucine. So, this kind of a L, 
X X L L motif is kind of conserved in a number of co-activators which are involved in the which mediate transcription activation by nuclear receptors. So, by studying the interaction of these various co-activators with a variety of nuclear receptors, people have identified that all these co-activators interact with these nuclear receptor superfamily members through this L X X L L motif. <coughs> For example, if you now take the SRC P160 family of proteins, they contain three such LXXLL MOFs somewhere close to the amino terminus <coughs> and it is these motifs which are actually involved in the interaction of the nuclear receptors. <coughs> this is just a cartoon to show that how in the presence of ligand, the helix 12 which is actually this kind of exposed outside is now taken inside and this helix 12 is now able to interact with the LXXLL motif of the co-activators and this is what facilitates transcription activation and these co-activators which now interact with the receptors can now interact with histone acetyl transferases which in turn acetylate histones leading to recruitment of the general transcription factors and RNA polymerase and resulting in the activation of transcription. So, the transcription activation by nuclear receptors are a kind of a two step process. So, you have a confirmation which is quite different in the absence of the ligand. Some of the key helices in the ligand binding domain which are very, very important for this transcription activation are shown here and this is the arrangement of the helices in the absence of the ligand and once the ligand binds to the ligand binding pocket of the nuclear receptor in the ligand binding domain and you can see there is a rearrangement of the helices, the helix 12 actually is taken inside and under this confirmation, now it can interact with the co-activator which contains the LXLL motif of the or the nuclear receptor box of the co-activator now can interact with the specific amino acid residues of these helices and this is how co-activators are recruited by the nuclear receptors. So, first the ligand binding with ligand binds induce a conformational change that thereby facilitating the interaction with the co-activators through the LXXLL motifs. In the case of for example, this kind of a LXSL motif contain co-activators are involved not only in the transcription activation by steroid hormone receptors like glucocorticoid receptor, but they are also involved in the transcription activation by the non-steroid hormone receptors or the uh, type 2 receptors. One of the examples I have shown is the RXR or AR heterodimers. This is also true, it can the, the, the partner can be either thyroid hormone receptor or it can be vitamin D receptor or it can be peroxone proliferator activated receptor or PPAR. So, all these receptors which bind as heterodimers with RXR, they actually dimerize using the dimerization interface in the AF2 domain, but once the ligand binds to the <coughs> retinoic acid receptor of the 3 prime half side binding partner and you can see now the interaction between the RXR ligand binding RAR ligand binding domain is kind of <coughs> We use a kind of distanced and now a co-activator can now be recruited and the LXXLL motif containing co-activators can now interact with the specific amino acids of the um, heterodimeric partner for XR resulting in activation of transcription. So, in this case it is the retinoic acid receptor which is interacting the co-activator, but if the heterodimer is RXR thyroid hormone receptor, then the thyroid hormone binds to thyroid hormone receptor here the same way a LXL kinetic partner can be recruited by another specific. LXSL partner can be recruited by the thyroid hormone receptor and the same thing holds for a vitamin D receptor or PPR and so on and so forth. So, the RXR NR heterodimer can interact with DNA and once the ligand binds the, <coughs> the AF2 domain can now go and interact with the LXSL containing activator uh, trans co-activators resulting in the activation of transcription. <coughs> now, so what we have discussed so far is the mechanism by which nuclear receptors activate transcription, nuclear receptors activate transcription primarily by co recruiting nuclear receptor co-activators and these co-activators can be a wide variety of types, they can be chromatin remodeling protein, they could be histone acetyl transferases, they could be protein methylases and so on and so forth. But the basic mechanism of recruitment of the nuclear receptor co-activators by the nuclear receptors involves interaction of the nuclear receptor co-activators through the LXXLL motifs with specific alpha helices of the ligand bound nuclear receptor. This is the general mechanism by which these nuclear receptors are able to recruit these co-activators and bring about transcription activation. Now, the question is how about transcription repression? How do the nuclear receptors interact with transcriptional repressors? So, what is the mechanism by which 
transcription depression is brought about by nuclear receptors because when there is no hormone or when there is no ligand many of this nuclear receptor is actually repress transcription from the of the target genes. So, how is this transcription depression brought about? It turns out in the absence of the ligand nuclear receptors interact with specific co repressors. So, in the presence of hormone because of a conformational change induced by the hormone the ligand binding domain can now interact with the coactivators whereas, in the absence of hormone the conformation of the ligand binding domain facilitates interaction with specific co repressors. <coughs> Some of the co repressors which have been identified to be involved in transcription repression by nuclear hormone receptors are what is known as NCO or, or nuclear receptor co repressor, SMRT or silencing mediator for retinoid and thyroid hormone receptor and some of the co repressors and these co repressors which interact with unliganded nuclear receptors actually serve as adapters for histone deacetylation factors. So, just like the coactivators of nuclear receptors interact with histone acetylases, bring about histone acetylation and activate transcription, in the absence of the ligand the same nuclear receptors interact with nuclear, uh, nuclear, co nuclear receptor co repressors and these co repressors in turn recruit molecules such as syn 3 or histone deacetylases resulting in the deacetylation of histones therefore, bind, tight binding of the histones leading to repression of transcription. So, the general mechanism which we studied for during the initial stages of this lecture series where transcription activation primarily involves loosening of the histones by recruiting proteins such as histone acetylate transferases whereas, repression of transcription primarily involves recruitment of histone methylases or histone deacetylases resulting in the tight binding of the histones leading to repression of transcription. This mechanism is true for the nuclear receptors as well. So, a number of such molecules which serve as transcription repressors for nuclear receptors have been identified. These include the NC or SMRT and so on and so forth and the general mechanism of transcription repression of steroid receptors or the nuclear receptors actually involves. When the nuclear receptors bind to the target sequences as dimers <coughs> in the absence of ligand <coughs> they, they interact with specific co repressors which could be either NCO or SMRT which in turn recruit the syn 3 or the histone deacetylases and they actually cause the histone deacetylations resulting in the repression of transcription. So, this is the general mechanism by which nuclear receptors bring about transcriptional repression. <coughs> For example, in the case of the retinoic acid receptor when there is no retinoic acid in the system the Rx or RAR, RAR heterodimer which binds to the DR5 or the direct repeat 5 kind of a sequence now interacts with the SMRT co repressor. This SMRT in turn recruits what is called the M syn 3 A as well as the histone deacetylases the H DAC 1 and as a result the histones are deacetylated this resulting in the repression of transcription. So, this is the mechanism what kind of co repressor is recruited depend varies from one receptor to another. In this case it could be SMRT in another case it could be NCO and so on and so forth. So, by recruiting specific co repressors which in turn recruit either histone methyl transferases or histone deacetylases transcription repression is brought about by nuclear receptors. Just as the LXX LL motif is involved in the interaction of coactivators and nuclear receptor ligand binding domain the same way a motif has been identified in the co repressor uh, nuclear receptor interactions. <coughs> this co repressor binding to the nuclear receptors for example, many of these co repressors which interact with nuclear receptors contain same LXXL like motifs, but not exactly LXXL motif and this could be LXXI or <coughs> HIXXXL or instead of leucine it can be isoleucine. <coughs> so, a modified motif of modified a variation of the LXXL motif is, has been identified in many of these nuclear receptor coactive co repressors and this motif is actually involved in the nuclear receptor interaction in the unliganded form. <coughs> so, this bar just as the LXSL box is known as the NR box or the nuclear receptor box, these are known as the co repressor nuclear receptor box or CO RNR boxes. <coughs> and these are actually located in the carboxy terminal of, for example, in the case of the nuclear receptor co repressor NCO or this kind of a box is present in the carboxy terminal of the NCO or repressor, co repressor. This just this slide just shows you that <coughs> this kind of a um, um, CO RNR boxes are the motifs involved in the transcription repression 
by the uh, nuclear receptor core repressors has been identified in a number of nuclear receptor nuclear uh, um, receptor core repressors and you can see <coughs> these are the motifs where it can be it corresponds to the consensus sequence show here i r l i l <coughs> x x c q this can be any amino acid similarly uh, uh, isoleucine or valine or i i i, I. <coughs> So, I R L X X I I. So, this is the motif that has been identified in the core repressors and through these motifs, these core repressors interact with unliganded nuclear receptors and bring about transcriptional repression. So, we will not go into the details of the various core receptor, co-activated core receptor interactions because there are a huge number of nuclear receptors a number of such coactivators and coactivator recruiting proteins have been identified and you can see <coughs> this just th this cartoon just shows three such examples where a nuclear receptor dimer is actually interact with a coactivator complex here which is quite different in another case it could be either src1 which in turn recruits cbp100 or the other receptor can actually inter which in turn interacts with the pcaf and a, these are all multi protein complexes and these coactivator complexes for example, here is the trap dip complex which is a multi protein complex and these in turn interact with the general transcription machinery and bring about transcription activation. So, what basically happens if here is another example where when there are two transcription factors binding side by side and one of them can interact with the PG1 which is called the polycomb uh, uh, group of proteins again we will not go into the details of this at now maybe we will discuss it in a later class and whereas the nuclear receptor recruits a um, histonestyl transferase the adjacent transcription factor can interact with the polycomb, uh, uh, polycomb group of proteins and synergistically they can ultimately result in the activation of transcription. So, in wide variety of variations of these co-activator co co-repressor combinations uh, can lead to either activation or repression of transcription in the case of nuclear receptors. So, what is the take home message? When you have a hormone that when the hormone enters the cell, it binds to specific nuclear receptors. In the case of steroid hormone receptors, the ligand the receptor is present in the cytosol. Therefore, the hormone binds to the cytosolic receptor then goes to the nucleus. Whereas, in the case of the type 2 receptors, the receptor is already bound to DNA inside the nucleus and the ligand goes and binds. And when the ligand binds, it induces a conformational change and facilitates interaction of the co-receptor, co-activator complexes which could be either <coughs> if it is SRC1, it can recruit the CBP or it could be PCAF or it could be the trap drip complex. Say wide variety of co-activator complexes can be recruited by the ligand bound nuclear receptor and these in turn interact with the general transcription machinery and activate transcription. Whereas, in the unliganded form, the same nuclear receptors actually interact with the nuclear receptor nuclear receptor core repressors which could be either NCO or SMRT and so on and so forth these in turn cause histone deacetylation and therefore repress transcription. So, this is the general mechanism by which nuclear receptors bring about either transcription activation or transcription repression. Now, in addition to the recruitment of these co-activators and co-repressors in the presence of ligand which is a direct mechanism, the co-activator co-repressor interaction with the nuclear receptor can also be affected by specific post translational modifications of these nuclear receptors. In the absence of hormone specific residues of nuclear receptor may be phosphorylated or they can be acetylated or they can be sumoylated, they can be ubiquinylated. A number of post translation modifications are possible and in the absence of hormone certain residues undergo post translation modification and when the same receptor binds to a hormone different sets of residues are undergo post translation modification and these post translation modification of receptor can determine whether the receptor can interact with the co-activator or whether it can interact with a co-repressor and ultimately whether the target genes can be activated or they can be repressed. So, nuclear receptor function can also be regulated by specific post translation modifications of amino acid residues of a nuclear receptor. Let us now look and see what kind of amino acid residues undergo post translational modifications <coughs> in the case of nuclear receptors. For example, <coughs> a number of signaling pathways it could be GPCR signaling or it could be tyrosine kinase receptor signaling or <coughs> it could be STAT or the cytokine receptor signaling and in many cases when signaling molecules interact with specific receptors the kinases which are activated by these signaling pathways sometimes they also go and phosphorylate specific amino acid residue in nuclear receptors and activate transcription of the 
hormone responsive genes. So, the genes which are responsive to hormones sometimes are not are activated or repressed not only in response to the presence or absence of hormone, but they can also be activated or repressed in response to specific membrane receptor signaling pathways. So, when certain molecules bind to specific membrane receptors, the kinases which are activated by this membrane receptor signaling may also phosphorylate the nuclear receptors and then alter the interaction of these receptors with co-repressor co-activators and therefore, target genes which are normally activated by hormones can now be activated by membrane receptor signaling through this phosphorylation cascade. <coughs> so, the activation function A f 1 domain of the N-terminus or the activation function to the ligand binding domain, the amino acid residues in these two domains can serve as targets for a number of protein kinases. Let us now discuss one or two examples to see how phosphorylation modulates the function of nuclear receptor function. Let us take the example of glucocorticoid receptor. <coughs> the human glucocorticoid receptor alpha has been shown to have several phosphorylation sites such as serine 113, serine 141, serine 203, serine 211, serine 27404. So, all the serine residues in the uh, nuclear receptor in the glucocorticoid receptor are targets for a number of protein kinases. <coughs> and many of these serine residues are located in the activation function 1 or the N terminal domain of the nuclear, nuclear receptor and phosphorylation of the human glucocorticoid receptor typically occurs after binding to the ligand and may determine this phosphorylation can determine the turnover of the receptor, it can affect the subcellular trafficking of the receptor or the target promoter specificity cofactor interaction, strength and duration of receptor signaling as well as receptor signaling. So, you can see in addition to the ligand binding, phosphorylation status of the nuclear receptor can affect a number of functions related to the nuclear receptor. It can affect the turnover of the receptor, it can affect the subcellular trafficking whether it should stay in the cytoplasm or go to the nucleus or it can affect the target gene specificity of the promoter or interaction with cofactors, coactivators or co-repressors the strength and duration of receptors in how long the receptor has to bound to chromatin and stay there is sometimes determined by the phosphorylation status of the receptor. And even the stability of the receptor is determined by phosphorylation. Sometime when the phosphorylation of the receptor triggers ubiquitinization of the receptor leading to degradation of the receptor. So, phosphorylation of this nuclear receptors play a very, very important role and a number of serine residues in the amino terminus of glucocorticoid receptor has been shown to be phosphorylated by a variety of protein kinases in the cell. Phosphorylation also modifies protein-protein interactions which can stabilize the hypophosphorylated form of the receptor in the absence of ligand as well as facilitate transcription activation by the hyperphosphorylation of the glucocorticoid receptor via recruitment of the ligand binding, cofactor recruitment by the ligand binding. So, phosphorylation of the specific amino acids residues can also modulate the ability of the receptor to interact with cofactors such as coactivators or co-repressors. Therefore, phosphorylation of nuclear receptors in general and here glucocorticoid receptor in, in particular is a very versatile mechanism for modulating and integrating multiple receptor functions. So, phosphorylation plays a very, very important role in the nuclear receptor signaling. A number of kinases, protein kinases which actually phosphorylate the glucocorticoid receptor have been identified. Some of them are listed here. For example, the E cycle independent kinase P34 CDC28 has been shown to be one of the protein kinases that can phosphorylate nuclear receptors. Similarly, the P38 mitogen activated protein kinase of the MAP kinase is another protein kinase that can phosphorylate glucocorticoid receptor. The central nervous system specific cycle independent kinase 5 or the CDK5 has also been shown to phosphorylate glucocorticoid receptor. And similarly, the glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta or the GSK3 beta which is actually known on the glycogen synthesis also is one of the kinases that can phosphorylate glucocorticoid receptor. Similarly, the C June internal kinase which is actually activated by the a number of membrane receptors of the growth factor signaling or the JNK can also either increase or decrease transcription activity of glucocorticoid receptors. So, this, this, uh, this uh, inclusion of the, the role of protein kinase as nuclear receptor signaling has added a new dimension for gene regulation by nuclear receptors. So, the not only the receptors can activity can be uh, influenced by nuclear uh, hormones, the receptor activity can also be influenced by phosphorylation of these receptors and this phosphorylation in turn can be determined by specific protein kinases which can be activated by multiple pathways including membrane receptor signaling pathways. <coughs>
So, a new paradigm emerged in the nuclear receptor signaling when it became clear that recept nuclear receptor function can be modulated by protein kinases which in turn can be activated through the membrane signaling, membrane receptor signaling pathway. So, <coughs> in addition to phosphorylation, number of other post translation modifications such as acetylation can also play a very important role. For example, the acetylation of glucocorticoid receptor has been shown to occur after ligand binding prior to nuclear translocation and the acetylated glucocorticoid receptor was acetylated by histone deacetylase and this deacetylation is necessary for glucocorticoid receptor to be able to inhibit nuclear uh, factor kappa b activation of inflammatory gene. So, in addition to the nuclear receptors activating transcription mm. by themselves in response to hormone by recruitment of coactivators, they can also glucocorticoids are very potent anti-inflammatory agents. And the mechanism by which sometimes the anti inflammatory effects are of glucocorticoids are brought about depends on the acetylation state of the receptor. So, the deacetylation of the acetylated glucocorticoid receptor is very, very important for uh, the inhibition of the NF kappa act, uh, B activation of the inflammatory genes. So, you can see the acetylation deacetylation of the nuclear receptor plays a very, very important role in the anti inflammatory response of properties of glucocorticoids. <coughs> And in fact, the exact site of the glucocorticoid receptor which is acetylated has been identified. This is called as a KKTK motif within the hinge domain region between the DNA binding domain, ligand binding domain, and amino acid region between 492 and 495 in the glucocorticoid receptor in the hinge region has been shown to be acetylated by specific acetylases. And this acetylated receptor <coughs> cannot activate anti inflammatory genes. And when it is deacetylated by histone deacetylators, it then can prevent the activation of genes involved in inflammation. Similarly, in the case of estrogen receptor, the transcription activity of estrogen receptor can be induced by growth factors such as epidermal growth factor or insulin growth factor through the RAS RAF MAP kinase pathway. We have discussed these pathways in our previous lectures. How <coughs> growth factors actually activate uh, transcription of genes by activation of the MAP kinase pathways. And you can see here, when growth factors bind to these growth factor receptors and the MAP kinase which are activated can also phosphorylate glucocorticoid receptor or estrogen receptor and this can also activate uh, estrogen responsive genes. <coughs> and human estrogen receptor has been shown to be phosphorylated by mitogen activated protein kinase at serine 118 located in the uh, AF1 domain here. <coughs> so, see some of the amino acids of the nuclear receptors are target for MAP kinases and these MAP kinases are intact, uh, in turn activated by membrane receptor signaling. So, phosphorylation of serine 118 results in stimulation of the AF1 of the estrogen receptor resulting in ligand independent activation of estrogen receptor. So, many a times genes target genes which are actually activated in response to estrogen hormone were found to be activated by growth factors also. People did not know how an estrogen response to gene could be activated by growth factors. By deciphering this mechanism, it is now becoming very clear that the AF1 domain of the estrogen receptor can be phosphorylated by MAP kinases, which in turn are activated by growth factor binding to growth factor receptors. And when this MAP kinases phosphorylate specific residues in the AF1 domain, since AF1 is a ligand independent activation function, they can now activate target genes even in the absence of hormone. So, you can see the the dogma that target genes which are estrogen responsive can be activated only in the presence of estrogen hormone is no longer true. These estrogen responsive genes can also be activated in estrogen independent manner through the growth factor signaling involving specific phosphorylation of amino acid residues in the activation one function 1 or the N terminal domain which encodes a ligand independent activation function. <coughs> So, there is a cross talk between nuclear receptor signaling and growth factor receptor signaling. So, growth factors can also activate nuclear receptors through the MAP kinase pathway. <coughs> Similarly, amino acid residues which are targets for specific kinases have also been identified in androgen receptor. These are all very, very important because you know as to androgen receptor signaling or activation plays a very important role in prostate cancer. So, in fact, many of the antagonists for uh, androgen receptor have been developed based on these particular properties. So, activation of androgen receptor can actually lead to prostate cancer and regulation of the activity of androgen receptor by developing specific antagonists and by identifying how androgen receptor is activated in the prostate cancer is a very, very important area of biomedical research. <coughs> Not only the steroid receptor like estrogen receptor, glucocorticoid receptor, androgen receptor are targets for phosphorylation, 
or targets for protein kinases, even non steroid nuclear receptors like retinoic acid receptor, retinoid X receptor, or vitamin receptor, they also undergo phosphorylation. For example, in the case of retinoic acid receptor, <coughs> specific sites which are phosphorylated have been identified in the internal domain as well as in the ligand binding domain, and the actual kinases which phosphorylate have also been identified. The same is true in the case of the Rx or alpha. So, a number of residues in the amino terminal domain as well as in the ligand binding domain are sub or phosphorylated by a number of protein kinases and this can also act modulate the activity of these uh, non steroid receptors. And all this phosphorylation of nuclear receptors also play a very very important role in biological processes. For example, the activation function of retinoic acid receptor alpha 1 and gamma 2 are phosphorylated by proline directed protein kinases. And this phosphorylation is required for retinoic acid induced differentiation into primitive endoderm, whereas phosphorylation of AF1 by RR alpha is required for differentiation into the parietal endoderm. So, during development, retinoic acid plays a very, very important role in embryonic development. And you can see this retinoic acid induced phosphorylation of specific amino acid residues in the AF1 function is very, very essential for the proper differentiation during embryonic development. And if you mutate these amino acids, which are targets for retinoic acid induced phosphorylation in the AF1 domain, embryonic development is affected, indicating that this phosphorylation of these nuclear receptors play a very, very important, uh, very, very important physiological functions. Similarly, in the case of the RAR alpha 1, alpha 2, the AF2 domain is also phosphorylated by protein kinase A, and phosphorylation of the AF2 domain of the retinoic acid receptor alpha 1 is required for differentiation into parietal endodermal cells. So, not only the um, phosphorylation of the amino acid in the AF1 domain, but the phosphorylation of the AF2 domain also has very, very important physiological functions, especially during embryonic development. So, the regulation of nuclear receptor function by phosphorylation has added an entirely new dimension to the nuclear receptor signaling. This phosphorylation can be either ligand independent or ligand dependent, and it can happen either in the activation function 1 or it can be activated in function 2. And all these modifications play a very, very important role in the physiological processes. So, this is the gist of what I told you so far. <coughs> in the previous classes, before we discussed nuclear receptors, we had discussed extensively how molecules which interact with membrane receptors activate gene expression through specific <coughs> signal transduction pathways. We have studied how cytokines can activate transcription through. Uh, the um, specific um, um, MAP kinase pathways. We have studied how growth factors interact with receptor tyrosine kinases and how through MAP kinase activation can activate transcription of target genes. We also studied how G protein coupled receptor or GPCRs can activate phospholipase C and leading to the activation of either PKC or cyclic independent protein kinase A, activation of protein kinase A and how they can go and phosphorylate target genes and activate transcription. What is different in this slide is that these pathways either the growth factor pathway or the G protein coupled receptor pathways or the stress cytokine pathways can also activate phosphor protein kinase pathways as, and these protein kinase also can go and phosphorylate nuclear receptors and modulate their function. So, there is an extensive cross talk between membrane receptor signaling and nuclear receptor signaling. Molecules which interact with specific membrane receptors can also activate nuclear receptors by protein phosphorylation cascades. So, it is not necessary that nuclear receptor need to be activated only by hormones which diffuse through the cell membrane and bind to the ligand binding domain of receptors and activate transcription. There are ligand independent mechanisms of activation of nuclear receptors and which involve specific protein kinases which in turn are activated by specific membrane receptor signaling pathways. There is also another mechanism by which this nuclear receptors play a very important role. <coughs> Uh, in regulation of gene expression. What we have discussed so far is the when the ligand diffuses through the cell membrane, it interacts the steroid receptors and these steroid receptors then homodimerize and bind to hormone response elements and activate transcription. This is what is called as the direct mechanism of transcription activation by nuclear receptors. But there is also an indirect mechanism where the ligand binds steroid receptor can also interact with other transcription factors and modulate their function. For example, this transcription factor can be AP1 it can be C June or it can be CREB. So, some of these transcription factors which are actually involved in growth proliferation responses or proliferation of growth 
and when they act with they can their activity can be inv in, uh, by inhibited by protein protein interactions where steroid ligand bound steroid receptors can interact with these transcription factors and modulate these functions. In fact, many anti proliferative properties of retinoic acid or glucocorticoid has been shown to be modulated through this pathway where in the presence of this ligand these hormone receptors can interact with specific transcription factors and prevent their function. And therefore, genes which are in cell proliferation can be inhibited and in fact, retinoic acid and glucocorticoid has shown to have anti proliferative properties and by inhibiting the function of transcription factors like C June and AP1, the glucocorticoids can actually prevent cell proliferation. So, this is another novel mechanism by which nuclear receptors can modulate gene expression that is by interacting with specific transcription factors through protein protein interactions. Okay. So, we will now come to the last part of this talk, we have discussed so far in the last <coughs> 3 classes how nuclear receptors bind to DNA, either as homodimers or as heterodimers and how they uh, interact with co-activators or co-repressors and activate transcription of target genes. Now, what are the benefits of understanding this nuclear receptor signaling? Has all this knowledge which you have amassed in the last 2 decades, has it really gone to benefit of the mankind? <coughs> for the answer for this question comes yes. The wealth of information that has accumulated on the functional interactions between nuclear receptors and co-regulators has exciting implications for the development of normal pharmaceutical therapies for a wide range of disease, diseases including a variety of cancers. Steroid hormones have been implicated in a variety of neoplastic diseases such as breast cancer, ovarian cancer and prostate cancer. The interface between the receptor activation function 2 elements and the nuclear receptor box of the co-regulators has been the subject of intense study for developing peptide based agonists and antagonists. We have studied so far that for a nuclear receptor to activate transcription, their interaction with either co-repressor or a co-activator is very, very essential. And we have studied that these co-activators interact with specific helices of the nuclear receptors through these LXSL motifs. Now, people are now asking the question, suppose if I design peptides contain LXSL motifs and add to and make them enter the cell, these peptides can go and bind to the uh, AF2 domains of the ligand binding receptor and therefore, compete for binding to the actual coactivator and therefore, can act as antagonists of nuclear receptors. So, can we develop peptide based therapeutics <coughs> using this kind of a protein protein interactions? So, if you now add for example, peptides containing the LXL motifs, they can actually compete with the co-activators and therefore, when these LXL containing peptides go and bind to the F2 domain, they prevent binding of the co-activators and therefore, the nuclear receptor will not be able to activate transcription. So, based on this knowledge, people are trying to develop peptide based pharmacological agents for uh, a number of uh, diseases which involve nuclear receptor activation. Similarly, <coughs> The levels of co-activators and co itself has been can contribute to disease. For example, tamoxifen which is an estrogen antagonist <coughs> has been shown to interact with specific co and decreased levels of nuclear receptor co nuclear receptor co, co have been detected in tamoxifen resistant MCF breast cancer cells. Now, one of the major mechanisms by which the breast cancer happens is by through the estrogen, now, estrogen receptor uh, for plays a very important role in the breast cancer and tamoxifen often is used as a uh, uh, antagonist of estrogen in these breast cancer to prevent this proliferation of these breast cancer cells. And in some cell lines which have become more tamoxifen resistant that is they no longer respond to tamoxifen and when they look at what is the mechanism by which these cell lines have become resistant to tamoxifen, they actually found that in these cell lines the level of expression of certain nuclear co nuclear free receptor co is very, very low. And therefore, because this low level of expression of these co-repressors, tamoxifen is not able to bring about transcription repression and as a result, these cell lines have now become highly proliferative and resistant to tamoxifen therapy. So, you can see how the level of expression of the co-repressors can also have a specific disease phenotype or contribute to disease phenotype. So, the levels of co-activators or co-repressors can also modulate the phenotype and contribute to a disease process. <coughs> This is just an example to tell you the understanding the molecular mechanism by which retinoic acid activates transcription, which is retinoic acid vitamin A derivative has opened up a new area of research and this table just shows you, this is actually taken from nature reviews cancer that a number of synthetic retinoids have been now developed <coughs> for treatment of a variety of cancers. For example, a all trans retinoic acid which is now being sold under a trade name tretinoin is actually being used for the treatment of promyelocytic leukemia. 
certain derivatives of 9 cis retinoic acid known commercially as alitrinoin and panretin or isotrinoin are being tested for treatment of Kaposi's sarcoma, breast cancer and skin cancer and so on and so forth. So, like this a number of variants of retinoic acid molecules are being tested for a variety of cancers, meaning that the knowledge that variants of retinoids or retinoid isomers bind to specific receptor cell types like RA or RXRs has now opened up a new area of research to see can we develop specific retinoid analogs or retinoid isomers which can act as selective or retinoic acid receptor phenotypes and therefore, can be used as therapeutic treatment in the case of various cancers. The field has now opened up and what started with steroid hormones. After steroid hormones, we have now shown that even vitamins such as vitamin D or vitamin A or even thyroid hormones activate regulation through this nuclear receptor family. Now, in addition to retinoic acid, we now have shown even fatty acids can serve as ligands for nuclear receptors. Receptors like peroxone proliferate activated receptors can be activated by fatty acids. Oxysterols derived from cholesterol can act as ligands for nuclear receptors such as LXR. Nuclear receptors such, such as FXR can be activated by bile acids. So, the bile acids in the gastrointestinal tract can actually serve ligands for these FXRs. All these have tremendous therapeutic implications. Similarly, certain xenobiotics or drug molecules can interact with specific nuclear receptors and can play a very important role in drug metabolism. And all these things have a tremendous implications. So, ligands for these nuclear receptors can not only be steroid hormones and vitamins, they can also be fatty acids, oxysterols, bile acids and so on and so forth. Last but not least, very exciting developments have taken place. In this slide, I have actually shown when you express a particular nuclear receptor called peroxone proliferator activated receptor delta, you can develop a transgenic mice which has a very high increase in the red muscle. This is a non transgenic mice or a wild type mouse muscle and is the muscle of the man, it has a very red muscle. The red muscle is increased. Now, what is the implication? These increase in red muscle contributes to a higher level of exercise activity by these mice. These mice can perform on a treadmill much better than the normal mice. What is the implication? Now, if you want to be an athlete, now if you can now take a drug which can activate peroxone proliferate activated receptor delta, you can run much faster and much longer than a normal athlete. So, you can actually develop anabolic compounds that can have a very important implications in winning races by athletes. So, it a very nice video of how exactly these transgenic mice perform is there in the YouTube and there are a number of website web links you can actually go ahead link and then see how these have tremendous implications. <coughs> so, these are some of the references I have listed here which you can go through and then see how we can understand some of the exciting development that are taking in the area of nuclear receptors and I think I will stop here. <coughs>